Good morning and a happy new year to you all. Uh, it's a great pleasure to talk to this international audience uh, spread over the Asia Pacific region. Uh, I would like to uh, not only deal with what happened at COP16 and what the outlook is beyond COP16, but also some of the factors that essentially led up to uh, what happened at COP16. So uh, let me go directly into what I was going to uh, present next. I'm essentially going to begin with some robust findings of the IPCC fourth assessment report, which as you know came out in 2007. Next. Uh, one major uh, statement that we made in that report was that climate change is unequivocal. And I think this is clearly the major driver for any discussions or negotiations uh, that we hope will lead to a multilateral agreement uh, to deal with all aspects of cl climate change on a comprehensive basis. I also next want to mention that there are, uh, on the basis of observations, several impacts of climate change that we can uh, look at. Next. Uh, firstly, let's look at what has happened to global average surface temperature. And as you would observe, over the last um, 150 odd years, uh, the temperature of the Earth has been fluctuating. And this is the result of both natural as well as human-induced changes that we are causing to uh, the Earth's climate. Uh, what's particularly relevant is to look at the trend over the last 50 years or so, where you see that it's upward. Now, of course, the fluctuations are the result largely of natural factors which affect the climate. But the uh, overwhelming evidence now indicates that human actions over the last 50 years or 60 years actually, since the middle of the uh, last century, have clearly overwhelmed uh, natural factors leading to an increase in temperature. And if you look at uh, next, <clears throat> the trend over the last 100 years, we find that average global temperature has changed about 0 0.74 degrees over the last 100 years. However, next, if you look at the last 50 years, then clearly the rate of warming has doubled. So we are clearly on a trend which shows much faster warming than was the case earlier on. Next. Uh, um, and uh, this again gives you uh, the same picture at the topmost graph. The uh, second graph gives you the changes in sea level which have occurred both on account of warming of uh, the oceans as well as the melting of the ice bodies as a result of changes in temperature. And uh, this uh, amounted to about 17 centimeters during the uh, 20th century. 17 centimeters, may I say, therefore, is very significant, particularly for those countries uh, which have large coastal areas which are low-lying or some of the small island states. And uh, the last picture over here also indicates the extent to which northern hemisphere snow cover, you know, the maximum land mass on this planet is essentially in the northern hemisphere and uh, snow cover has been depleted quite significantly. Next. Um, and one major factor where we see the impact of climate change on the uh, mass of ice that we have on land areas is in respect of the cumulative balance of glacier mass. And you can see over here, almost across different regions of the world, the mass of glaciers has actually declined quite significantly, some more than the others. But uh, this is clearly something that we have to worry about because there are implications in respect of supply of water. Often glaciers are referred to as the water towers of the earth. And if these water towers reduce uh, the size and quantity of ice that is stored over there, 
that obviously has implications for water supply dependent on these sources. And I've already shown you this, but it's important to observe the legend at the bottom, uh, which clearly indicates that global average sea level has risen, risen since 1961 at an average, average rate of 1.8 millimeters per year, and since 1993 at 3.1 millimeters per year. So this again clearly shows that melting has been much faster in recent years than earlier on. Next. Uh, the causes of change are also uh, something to be concerned about because this is largely the result, as far as human-induced climate change is concerned, uh, largely the result of burning of fossil fuels. Uh, now, despite the fact that in 1992 we came up with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, if you look at global greenhouse gas emissions since 1970, they have increased 70% up to 2004. And I can tell you the record since 2004 also indicates somewhat similar trends. Uh, we also know that CO2 annual emissions have grown even faster by about 80%. And one important conclusion that we came up with is that most of the observed increase in temperature since the mid-20th century is very likely due to the increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations. Next. Um, we also know that projected surface temperature uh, has varied across the planet and uh, will continue to vary. Uh, the darker shades over here indicate uh, greater increases in temperature than those which are lightly shaded. Uh, our projections indicate that uh, in the 21st century, if we look at the best estimate at the lower end of the range that has been projected, it would be about 1.8 degrees Celsius, and at the upper, upper end, about 4 degrees Celsius. Um, so even at the lower end, the 1.8 degrees Celsius, combined with the 0 0.74 degrees uh, that has taken place during the 20th century, would uh, ensure that total temperature increase in these two centuries, let's say since uh, the pre-industrial period, more or less, would be more than 2.5 degrees Celsius. And I think one of the important uh, statements coming out of Cancun is that the world should limit temperature increase to about 2 degrees Celsius. And this means interventions are important and urgent, because if we don't bring about those interventions, then we would end up by the end of this century with a temperature increase overall of far more than 2.5 degrees Celsius. Next. Um, we also know that climate change could lead to some abrupt and irreversible impacts. And I think as uh, risk-averse societies and individuals, it's important for us to ensure that even though these may be low probability events, uh, they would have a very high impact. And Obviously, when you're dealing with high-impact uh, dangers, uh, even though they have low probability, it is for us to ensure that we eliminate even that small probability of their occurrence. Uh, and 20 to 30 percent of the species that we have assessed could be at the risk of extinction if increases in warming exceed 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius. Next. Um, and some regions are more vulnerable than others. The Arctic, for instance, Africa, small island states, Asian and African mega deltas. And this includes mega deltas like Shanghai, Dhaka, Kolkata. These are large concentrations of population uh, with a substantial, a substantially high density of uh, life and property over there. And these are particularly vulnerable to flooding and uh, the problems uh, resulting from sea level rise. Next. Now, uh, I am mentioning all this because uh, if we really want uh, negotiations to proceed along desirable directions, we have to remain constantly conscious of the science of climate change and the assessment carried out by the IPCC. Because in the absence of that, there is really no rationale, there is no 
logic for us to come up either with a reduction in emissions of greenhouse gases or to implement um, measures by which we can adapt to the impacts of climate change which are inevitable. And here, let me emphasize that there is a certain inertia in the system uh, which would ensure that even if we were to bring down emissions of greenhouse gases literally to zero, uh, climate change will continue for a few decades because there is a certain inertia based on the scientific reality of, let's say, you take the case of the oceans. The oceans have warmed at the upper layers so far, and that warming is gradually sinking down to the lower depths. And that's not going to stop. And therefore, the expansion of the oceans will continue for a while. Similarly, much of the infrastructure that we have is dependent on the use of fossil fuels. And therefore, you can't change it overnight. And uh, emissions will continue um, to a certain level, whatever you do at this point of time. There, are also, there is also inertia in terms of human actions and habits and lifestyles, and that's not going to change overnight. So some level of climate change is inevitable, and we will have to adapt to that. However, given what I showed you earlier, the fact that if we don't do anything, even at the lower end of the best estimates that we have, uh, we would have a substantial amount of climate change which goes totally beyond what Cancun has laid down as a target for stabilization of the Earth's climate. Uh, so global action has so far certainly been influenced by the science of climate change, and it must continue to do so, because if we lose sight of the scientific rationale and the basis for taking action, then we really have no means by which we can ensure that that action will take place. Next, uh, we need to address this problem firstly by creating understanding of the interrelationships between human actions and the environment, by assessing the future impacts and key vulnerabilities, by defining possible scenarios of actions and their consequences, and by defining specific solutions that can address the problem if applied on a large scale. And I think the negotiations as they proceed have to take these factors into account, because unless one is aware of the solutions and what they imply, we clearly are not going to come up with any agreement that would ensure the uh, design and implementation of those solutions. Next. Uh, this is just a listing of what uh, the influence has been on specific actions. Uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which uh, came into existence in 92, was influenced greatly by the first assessment report. The Kyoto Protocol was influenced by the second assessment report. The third report certainly focused on adaptation measures. And uh, I think the fourth assessment report has certainly created a basis for a post-Kyoto Protocol agreement. But that, of course, is proving to be very complicated because you run into the problem of what people see as burden sharing. Who's going to carry how much of the burden in dealing with this problem? Uh, What's important to remember is Article 2 of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which clearly lays down that uh, the ultimate objective of this convention is the stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And one could imply that the two-degree target that has been set in Cancun, uh, in a sense, represents the threshold of uh, temperatures beyond which the world feels it might be entering an area of dangerous anthropogenic interference. But that, of course, involves a va value judgment. There are some who feel that 1.5 degrees should be the limit. And this is what negotiators have to grapple with. And incidentally, uh, the Cancun, uh, Cancun statements also lay down the need for reviewing this two degree target and perhaps looking at the 1.5 degree target on the basis of scientific evidence that evolves. Next. Um, I believe that uh, uh, COP16 was certainly 
cognizant of the findings of the fourth assessment report uh, and there are, as these um, uh, paragraphs clearly indicate, uh, direct reference to the intergovernment pan intergovernmental panel on climate change and the fourth assessment report. Uh, and uh, I imagine that these would remain clearly in focus even as the uh, negotiations proceed post Cancun. Um, now, what are the salient features of the Cancun agreements? Well, commitment to keep the rise in average temperature below 2 degrees Celsius. A Cancun adaptation framework was agreed on, which is very heartening. It brings countries GHG emissions reduction targets under the UNFCCC program process and it calls for international assessment and review of developed country emissions and international consultation and analysis of developing country actions. Uh, I'm not too sure what the distinction is between these two uh, phrases, but clearly this means that um, commitments in both developed and developing countries uh, will get the attention of the global community. The establishment of a green climate fund uh, but, of course, there was no agreement on the second commitment period after the expiry of the Kyoto Protocol in 2012, and this, to my mind, is uh, not a happy situation. Um, let me quickly finish by um, mentioning science as a driver for progress as COP17 in 2011, because now we need to focus on what happens in COP17. Uh, we certainly need deeper understanding and quantification of these processes uh, rapidly since the IPCC first assessment report. There, there's been a substantial advance of scientific uh, uh, assessment, scientific knowledge uh, in the field of climate change, and therefore now we have much more data, much more analysis, and therefore much better projections of the future, and this must be kept clearly in mind. Uh, I also believe that a uh, wide range of mitigation options are currently available, and these have been assessed very carefully. Now, it is clearly mistaken and mythical to believe that mitigation options are going to prove extremely expensive, because the reality is that mitigation of emissions of greenhouse gases also leads to several co-benefits, and these can be in the nature of higher energy security, much lower pollution at local levels and therefore health benefits and a much higher productivity in agriculture and uh, in all likelihood much greater employment opportunities as a result. Uh, I'm not going into the details of these mitigation technologies but these have been clearly assessed and spelled out in the fourth assessment report. They apply to the energy supply industry, to transport, to buildings. Uh, and I'd like to emphasize that um, we have to keep in mind the fact that the optimal path for stabilization of concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere would require that global emissions of greenhouse gases peak in 2015 and no later than that. And that's really around the corner. Uh, so there is a sense of urgency which I hope the negotiators and governments will not lose sight of. <clears throat> um, well, uh, I again will not go into the details over here, but it's particularly important that mitigation takes place early because the more you postpone it, the more expensive these options are going to become over time. Because look at it in very simple terms. If you allow infrastructure to come up, which is based, let's say, on the use of fossil fuels, then clearly to replace that infrastructure as it grows in the next few years, would cost much more than if you, you were to replace it or bring about a transition uh, as early as possible. Uh, we need to also keep in mind that what we have assessed clearly shows that developed countries need to significantly reduce their emissions below 1990 levels, uh, 10 to 14 percent by 2050 and 40 to 95 percent by 2050. And developing countries would have to deviate below their projected baseline within the next few decades. So, you know, this has to be a global cooperative by which we bring about an agreement that involves certainly first 
and uh, foremost action by the developed countries, but also certain very important action by actions by the developing countries. And essentially, this means that we have to come up with a new development path that creates some new sectors of the economy, new employment, rather than pursuing the paths that we have been on for maybe 150 years or so. And I'll end by giving the words of Mahatma Gandhi, who said, be the change you want to see in the world. And therefore, while we want the world to take certain actions on a global basis, on a, under a multilateral agreement, I think it is for all of us, and certainly the leaders of intellectual thought, like the universities who are assembled for this lecture, to take initiatives and action. And I can tell you, I'm now associated with Yale University, and there's a major effort on the part of students and faculty over there to bring about a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And I hope universities across the globe will pursue this path because we can make a difference not only in our own terrains, in our own premises, but as citadels of learning and knowledge, we can influence the thinking of society all around. So thank you very much, and I'll be very happy to answer questions now. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bhattari, for giving us a very comprehensive uh, overview of the state of climate change, the role of IPCC, and also the options for the future. Uh, especially, I think we all had uh, new information on climate change, uh, as well as the increased trends, which have been recently observed. Uh, but also, the lecture also covered how science can help in arriving at global consensus in uh, tackling the climate change uh, challenges. And at the end, we had a very strong message that not only the, what we have to, how we should uh, try to adhere to the targets we have agreed on, but also that our efforts should also link with the sustainable societies for the future, that we all have a role to play in this effort. Now, we have about 35 minutes, and we have nine universities connected today, and we have a very large audience here at uh, UNU, also at AIT, University of Hawaii, and so on. So we would like to start a uh, discussion, and uh, Dr. Pachauri has to leave at, uh, in about 35 minutes, as I understand, for another conference. So we'll try to make use of this time uh, to the, the best of our uh, needs. What we would like to do is we would like to go around the institutions, starting with UNU, followed by University of Hawaii and Asian Institute of Technology, so the first three institutes. We may also think of, you, know, you may think of your questions, we can have on one section would be on uh, perhaps on the evidences, impacts and vulnerabilities which uh, Dr. Pachar discussed. Secondly, we also have uh, the actions leading to COP17 in South Africa, and also the assessment report five, especially he mentioned also the emphasis on the regional uh, assessments and also the improvements uh, related to science uh, and the future scenarios. And finally, we would also have another area maybe very interesting is the uh, mitigation options and also the linkage between sustainability and what we can do. And also beyond this, you may have your own any other questions, uh, which you may make this use of this opportunity to ask Dr. Pachar. So first, uh, let us start from UNU side. Do we have any questions? We have Mark. Yes, uh, maybe we have a chair. Uh, it could be seen by everyone. Uh, thanks for your lecture, Dr. Pachari. Um, if I may, I have a comment and then a question. Um, my comment is that the title of your, your talk was uh, Reflections of COP16, but, but um, to be completely honest, there wasn't many reflections on COP16 in your talk. So I'm wondering if, given you have this uh, rare opportunity to talk to the future leaders in the Asia-Pacific region who are studying climate change and energy security, if you could re actually reflect a bit more on COP16 um, and, and some of the, the I, I understand you're in a position where you need to be careful about what you speak politically, but I still feel there's a lot more to explain about uh, what came out of COP16 and what you want to see 
uh, leading into COP17 because I think that people are still confused about what came out of COP16 and the general population is still very disenchanted by the, the weak language that came out of that and, the, and of course the, the lack of actions that have followed that. My question is more specific, it's about um, the meeting that took place in Cancun. I think it was around December the 10th and it was I think some of the largest companies in the world, 400 of them who had uh, taken at least on paper some initiative to to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to end deforestation by 2020. I'm wondering what you see is the role of the private sector in um, in ending in you know uh, addressing issues like climate change and deforestation. And do you think they can fill the gap that that has been left there by by the country, the nation states of the world who have to to date failed to actually uh, produce any meaningful outcomes on that front. Thank you for your time. Uh, well, you like the reason why. One? Okay. Well, well, or would you mm -hmm. want me to take one or two? Okay. I, I, I'll well, take no, maybe one or two more and then... Right. Can I yes. We would have one or two more and then... Uh, yes, uh, Brandon. Yes, but, um, Dr. Pachauri, thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to ask you about uh, climate change tipping points. Um, a number of scientists, including James Hansen, have talked about these tipping points and how they uh, can potentially amplify the effects of man-made warming. Examples include uh, ocean acidification and warming so that the oceans can no longer absorb as much CO2 or the melting of the, the permafrost in Siberia releasing methane into the atmosphere. I just wonder um, whether the IPCC will be looking into these, uh, these issues, uh, the issue of tick tipping point in um, either the fifth assessment report or in future assessment report. Okay, Brandon, so we could take one more. Uh, not yes. Thank you very much, sir, for the presentation. Uh, my question is with regard to the state of inertia you mentioned. Uh, I'm of the view that naturally we expect the Earth as a system to readjust itself with the emergence of the changes. So talking about the state of inertia being reached and the present adaptation measures we are taking, what do you actually expect to be the state of the climate, I mean, in the years to come? Because I presume we're going to have a confused state which we have to study further. I don't know if you can answer Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. Let so me. Like yes. Three questions. Sure. Uh, could I start with the third question on the issue of uh, the inertia in the system? <clears throat> you know, the uh, inertia is a reality, and uh, anything that uh, sort of uh, challenges status quo uh, is something that has to deal with inertia. I don't want to draw an analogy, but you know, if you look at what happened in the case of knowledge that came out showing that there's a link between smoking and lung cancer, there was a ferocious fight to disprove the science. There were also efforts to say that, look, there's no scientific basis for arriving at a conclusion on uh, uh, the fact that there is a very clear link between these two. And as a result, I think action was delayed, and it's still delayed, around the world. And look at the number of lives that could have been saved if we had taken immediate action. But the inertia is a reality that we cannot ignore. And the only thing that can reduce that inertia, in my view, is knowledge and the spread of knowledge. And that's precisely why I emphasize the importance of the scientific findings uh, of the thousands of scientists who are working in this field and the consensus that exists on the link between climate change and several of the impacts that we have been observing for several years and which we have projected will take place perhaps to a greater degree in the future. So uh, I think it is critically important that universities, uh, centers of knowledge and education get involved in this business uh, as quickly as possible, because in my view, uh, uh, and, and even the record shows that whatever little action we have today 
is the result of the spread of knowledge. And I think the more that knowledge spreads, uh, the more it would overcome the inertia in the system. Uh, having said so, let me go to the first question. Uh, yes, I uh, deliberately did not go into uh, what really happened in COP16 because uh, let me make a very general statement. COP16 was largely a holding pattern. It was uh, uh, a useful meeting where I think the spirit was certainly much more positive than I found in Copenhagen. And I think some of the, the decisions that were taken at least bring out a framework within which action can take place. But to be quite honest, there were no agreements really to take action at this point of time. So what can I say about uh, Cancun other than what I referred to very briefly? What I wanted to emphasize was that coming out of Cancun, I think it is important to remember that the driver of action and any agreement that hopefully will come about in um, Durban uh, this year, later this year, or maybe a little later, has to be driven by science. And I think this is where uh, I'm at least satisfied that Cancun did take cognizance of the scientific assessment of climate change. And other than that, to be quite honest, I know there's been a lot written in the media, several headlines on who said what and who took what positions versus the other. Uh, there really is very little substance that one can talk about in terms of uh, analyzing what happened in, in Cancun. And maybe uh, what happened over there is beyond my capabilities to, to analyze. You know, I've seen the outcome of several conferences of the parties, uh, and often you have words which make a lot of sense, which give you some hope, but in the end, I think it is really our ability to understand the scientific rationale for taking action that will give substance to those words. Uh, and I therefore really did not spend too much time going into the words that came out of Cancun. Perhaps somebody else would be better qualified to do that. Um, the role of the private sector is crucial. And I'm really happy that the Mexican government went out of its way to invite several leaders of business. Uh, and I myself took part in a couple of sessions which were and I addressed a couple of those sessions, which uh, I think was um, an extremely important uh, part of what should happen in a COP. Because we must understand that what you really need is the involvement of all stakeholders. Governments are crucial. Governments are at the center of what needs to be done. But unless business, unless civil society, unless research and academia get involved in a concerted effort, we are not going to get any results. And I think it's critically important for leaders of business and industry to understand the reality of climate change and why it is in their own interest to take action. Not only because, uh, you know, business cannot possibly succeed if, if society is not succeeding, but also because irrespective of any agreement which comes into place or otherwise, we are going to see a distinct shift in our energy decisions in the future. And we are definitely going to move to a more energy efficient future. We would certainly be more reliant on renewable sources of energy, all of which throws up business opportunities. And I think the leaders of business and industry must understand those opportunities. So uh, it's, um, it's clearly uh, now uh, established that uh, governments alone cannot tackle this task of dealing with climate change. Business has to be an important partner. Uh, the second set of questions on tipping points. Yes, we are indeed looking at, um, on a scientific basis, looking at what might constitute uh, what you might call irreversible or abrupt changes. <coughs> we have referred to them in the fourth assessment report. But in the fifth assessment report, I think we would be able to do much greater justice. I also want to 
mentioned to you that by the end of this year we are bringing out a special report on extreme events. Uh, and that I think will be an extremely important report because it will give us uh, a much better understanding of how climate change is leading to a change in the frequency and intensity of extreme events. Because the damage that takes place with these extreme events can be enormous as we've seen in several cases. So yes, the answer is that the IPCC is looking into this on a scientific and credible basis and in the fifth assessment report I hope we'll be able to provide much more material and information on the basis of which uh, we can identify what the tipping points are or are likely to be in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pachauri. I think we have uh, off to a very good start. Uh, I think we will continue first, the first round, and then come back and try to uh, uh, go through the loop if there are any left or questions. Uh, University of Hawaii, do you have any questions to Dr. Pachauri? Yeah, but yeah, we have a few. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pachari. Um, Chad Durkin, I'd like to ask you um, about your role as a scientist versus a policymaker um, based on your, your current involvement with the IPCC and, and the COP summits. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, kind of the, as you said, science is now uh, needs to drive the policy. Um, how can you remain uh, objective in the face of uh, scientific uncertainty? Well, you know, there will always be some level of scientific uncertainty. I mean, um, it's the very nature of the system of climate and climate change uh, that would uh, go against perfect certainty in any statements. But, you know, it is important for us to uh, see that as risk-averse individuals, what we should be concerned with is the management of risk. and to the extent possible, the elimination or the minimization of risk. Uh, the IPCC, by its very character, uh, is a policy-relevant body, but not a policy-prescriptive body. And sometimes, you know, that dividing line becomes a little blurred. But may I go back to the original, uh, uh, the original, uh, decision of the UN General Assembly by which the IPCC was established. It clearly called for realistic are assessing all the aspects of science, but also uh, uh, realistic response strategies. So, you know, it is important for us to remember that we have to assess specific strategies. While we won't advocate one strategy versus the other, uh, we would be failing on, in our responsibility if we didn't look at specific response strategies. That once you assess the extent and magnitude of climate change and how it's going to take place in the future, we need to come up with strategies by which the problem can be dealt with. Uh, now, you could say that's really uh, going into the arena of policy, but, you know, it's really an assessment of policies. Now, when I have to talk to an audience, people ask me for examples, and I, can, I can't possibly say, look, I have no examples. It is appropriate for me to give those examples, and I'm not advocating any one of them. Uh, so I can tell you this is a tightrope walk. It's not easy. But on the other hand, if the IPCC has to be policy relevant, we can't walk away from the assessment of policies themselves, and that's what we try to do. Uh, it's not an easy task, I can tell you that. And uh, in, the, in mentioning these policies, you look at uh, the upside as well as the downside. And, you know, if there are risks associated with each one of them, we need to identify and to the extent possible quantify them. That, that's what we try to do. But I can tell you, by the time we have perfect certainty on everything associated with our assessment of uh, climate change, uh, it would probably be a little too late to take action. Uh, a, a, a very distinguished minister from a country gave me uh, uh, an example, which I'll just quote for you, uh, for whatever it's worth. 
He said, look, let's say there are a hundred people who are telling you, don't cross this bridge uh, because it's likely to col collapse if you cross it. And then there are ten people who tell you, no, no, it's perfectly safe. Go ahead and cross that bridge. And he also added something which I'm not going to uh, uh, mention as something I agree with. He said, those ten guys might very well be paid by the ones who constructed the bridge in the first place. Now, who would you listen to? The hundred people who are telling you not to cross the bridge or the ten who tell you go ahead and cross it? And similarly, if you have a probability that uh, something fairly negative is going to happen in the future, say to the extent of 50% or 60% probability, uh, I think as rational human beings, we would take that very seriously. Thank you very much, Dr. Pachauri. Do we have any more questions Thank from you. one more from Hawaii? Uh, two more? All right. All right. Okay. Oh, sure. Thank you, Dr. Pachauri, for your excellent presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, has uh, commoditized food or agricultural products been uh, evaluated in light of the phenomenon of uh, climate change? So in other words, uh, people can hedge their bets or when, when determining prices of these commoditized agricultural products like coffee or orange, uh, orange juice, et cetera, um, is climate change being taken into consideration and, and, or are these agricultural products actually flexible enough in their, in their, uh, in their growing habits or, uh, to withstand climate change as we understand it. So, in other words, how does climate change affect our agricultural production and have we reached a tipping point in, in where climate change would actually affect commoditized agricultural products? The price? Uh, uh, well, that's the, a good... Uh, Dr. Pachar, shall you also take the next question from, you know, Sure. Uh, sure. Hawaii. Sure, yes. by all means. Okay. Um, next question to Hawaii. Okay. Uh, my question actually was more uh, towards uh, global carrying capacity. And I know it's kind of a touchy subject because people don't like to talk about, you know, regulating our reproduction. And I just feel that carrying capacity is such a, you know, really like the root of what, you know, uh, it's caused climate change. You were putting out more emissions because there's more people. It's just, it's, going to be the issue and I just want to know how much you know what's the weight of that and how much uh, how it's been dealt with within your discussions and IPC stuff and uh, basically I mean from what you if it's a serious issue from what you guys have found uh, what are some of the ways you guys have come to you know the best way to deal with that and do you guys come with ideas that we can you know actually regulate carrying capacity or is it just too you know touchy of a subject Thank you. Well, let me respond to both these questions. As far as agriculture is concerned, uh, all the work that's been carried out scientifically shows that there are variations in terms of the impacts of climate change. Um, for instance, uh, just to give you uh, the evidence from research that's been carried out in India, uh, it's now obvious that even with the level of climate change that we have today, the wheat crop is being affected adversely. And that happens because temperatures during a particular period of the cycle of growing of wheat uh, are now higher than what they used to be. And that has a major impact on the productivity of wheat being grown in some parts of India. In other parts of the world, there's actually a slight increase because of the higher level of CO2 and therefore photosynthesis being much higher. But overall, we have come to the conclusion that beyond the point, if climate change continues, then the overall impact globally on um, all, most food crops uh, and other uh, crops uh, would be negative. And that clearly has an impact on global food security. Now, that's something which we brought out very clearly in the fourth assessment report, I expect we'll have much greater research evidence 
for the fifth assessment report and may therefore be able to come up with uh, uh, a revision of what we have been able to say so far. But the essential conclusion is that if we don't arrest climate change um, at a certain level, then the, uh, the, the productivity of uh, a large number of crops would actually go down, and that has serious implications for food security. Uh, on the question of uh, carrying capacity, yes, population is certainly an important issue, uh, but I, I am, I'm reminded of um, a conference that my institute had organized in Washington, D.C. many years ago, and this was on population, environment, and development. And Senator Tim Worth at that point of time gave a talk over there, and he said, uh, look, we have a population problem in, in the U.S. He said, because we add about 3 million people to our population each year, and each American consumes 40 times as much as a Bangladeshi does. So therefore, we are really adding 120 million Bangladeshis to our population each year. Uh, Tom Friedman talks about the fact that the problem is there are far too many Americans all over the world because, you know, those who become prosperous, even in poor societies, set standards for consumption which are very similar to what you have in North America. So I think you really need to look at both. Uh, the carrying capacity is a function not only of the number of people on the planet, but the manner in which and the extent to which we exploit our natural resources and therefore erode that carrying capacity. And I think our mitigation measures will have to come up with changes in technology, changes in lifestyles, by which we bring about a reduction in that burden. Otherwise, we're going to continue to increase the concentration of greenhouse gases. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Pachauri. So our responses to climate change also has to be very much linked with the sustainability of the whole planet through our other actions. We have 10 more minutes, so we would now go to Asian Institute of Technology. Do you have uh, some questions to Dr. Pachauri? Yeah, Mr. Uh, maybe have one or two questions. Yes. Uh, uh, please make it brief, and we'll have both the questions together, and then Dr. Pachauri will respond. Uh, Dr. Pachauri, uh, you mentioned science as a driver for actions and also the uh, medication technologies. Uh, however, if we think what happened in multilateral uh, climate negotiations, it's more a political discussion. For instance, the discussions on transfer of technologies and also funding support. So my question is how science can act as a driver also for political actions. Hello, Dr. Pachori. I'm very pleased to uh, be talking to you. Thanks for your um, presentation and thanks for all the energy you've been um, passing through. I know it's a hard fight. My question is, you've been mentioning the big oil and we all know that um, greenhouse gases um, problems and uh, fuel depletion, fossil fuel depletion is very important. Don't you think that IPCC should uh, more talk also about not climate change, but climate change and fossil fuel depletion? because it's very connected uh, problems and the issue you mentioned two or 15 is coming very close now and people should react about it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can those two questions. Well, let me respond yes, quickly to those two questions. Well, um, uh, you know, I believe that uh, particularly since the bulk of human society is living under democratic systems. Uh, I think if we need a global agreement that is effective, it must stand on the support of local actions. If people locally feel that they are not in support of the actions that are required, then you can't expect world leaders uh, to come up with an agreement uh, that goes against, uh, against the priorities or preferences of local actions. And therefore, I'm now convinced that the, the important ingredient that will bring about uh, an effective global agreement would be 
effective local actions. And uh, the IPCC really cannot do very much to influence the political process, uh, except to bring out the assessment. And I think our partners and those who believe in the science of climate change are the ones who have to get involved in spreading the message and spreading the knowledge that comes out of IPCC assessments. And I think that would provide the major driver and the major force for ensuring political action nationally, subnationally, and multilaterally. Uh, so uh, I think that's the best one can hope for. On the issue of uh, fossil fuels, yes, in the fourth assessment report, we have clearly brought about the importance of moving away from fossil fuels. And of course, whatever fossil fuels are going to be used must be used much more efficiently. And we have looked at a whole range of options uh, which have been assessed by which it is obvious that the cost of taking action in several cases is negative. You know, you would actually save money by taking some of those actions and that clearly proves that there are institutional weaknesses and flaws either in the pricing or the organizations that are meant to implement policies and they are therefore not working uh, in a manner that maximizes the economic welfare of society. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, essentially we have to uh, somehow spread this message and uh, there are countries which have started taking action very effectively to move towards greater use of renewable energy and uh, use fossil fuels much more efficiently. Uh, the fact that you have more efficient automobiles, you have regulations to bring about improvements in efficiency of automobiles, of air conditioners, uh, homes that are constructed and so on, is the kind of trend that has to intensify. And it would intensify if um, we realize that time is really of the essence and we have to start taking action urgently. Thank you very much, Mr. Patel. Now we would like to ask Waseda University if you have any questions. After Waseda, we would go to Keio and then Okoyama University. Waseda University? Uh, we don't have audio Hello. from Waseda University. Oh, okay. okay. Hello. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. And I would like to ask one question. How we can maybe... um make China and India and Brazil or other developing countries more involved in this um, agreement and um, tackling against this climate change. And maybe one method I now am thinking about is maybe we can first um, make, the, make these countries commit um, different targets, uh, maybe like lower targets than other developed, co developed countries. And maybe it's, um, I don't know, but I'm, I've been wondering how we can maybe um, make more developing countries involved to um, tackle against this global warming together. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Professor. You know, yes, the, developing, the developing countries are engaged, and as you know, perhaps uh, you're not aware that in Copenhagen, both China, India, as well as Brazil, uh, made commitments to reduce the emissions intensity. China went to a target of 40% over 2005 levels, India 25% over 2005 levels, and Brazil also made some major commitments. Uh, so I think the developing countries are engaged, but if I may say, uh, it would have helped greatly if those countries that had commitments on the, under the Kyoto Protocol were to ensure that those targets which they had accepted were met. That unfortunately is not happening. And therefore, you know, that clearly reduces uh, the conviction that you can create around the world that everybody has to get involved. Because some countries believe that those who should have taken action are not really uh, doing enough to meet their own commitments. Uh, so I, I think this is an area where everybody has to get involved 
uh, as clearly laid down on the principle of common but differentiated responsibility in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Thank you, Dr. Kachar. We know that I'm we sorry, have I have just another two or three minutes and I'll have to leave. Yes, uh, yes that's what I was going to ask whether you have another five minutes. Probably not, is it? <laughs> I'm, I'll have to leave in three minutes because I have an <laughs> engagement where one of our senior ministers is also present. I, it'll be oh, yes. treated as an, as an insult to arrive late. Yeah. Right. Uh, maybe we could have just one short question if any one of the universities. Please raise the hand. Please raise the hand if you have any important last question. Uh, University of Rikyus. Yes, please. Please make it very short. One minute. Very short. One minute. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for a very inspiring presentation. Uh, just one so, uh, quick question. Uh, as you mentioned, the uh, and the politics and uh, uh, science and economics are driving our society. But uh, I wonder how do you think about the involvement of religions in as a, a different kind of uh, work frame for reducing the emission of greenhouse gases? Thank you. Well, that's a very good question because, you know, every religion in the world uh, preaches a certain reverence for uh, nature and what we are doing by altering the concentration of gases in the atmosphere is essentially not respecting uh, that very basic tenet of every religion in the world. So I would like to see faith organizations and leaders of religion uh, taking some action and some are actually doing that. But if we want to spread the message and spread the knowledge related to climate change, I think we should certainly treat some of these leaders as an audience because you're absolutely right, they can make an enormous difference. Uh, there is an issue of ethics which we are going to examine in the fifth assessment report of the IPCC and uh, I hope we can shed a little more light on this aspect as well. Thank you very much. You. I'm sorry that uh, I would have to leave but I'm very uh, uh, happy to have given, been given this opportunity and uh, I wish you all the best and I hope uh, through your efforts we'll see a better and a cleaner world in the future. Thank you very much Dr. Pachauri. You have been very inspiring and I think all of our young researchers uh, have a new, you know, uh, renewed, renewed commitment to uh, uh, address the climate change uh, challenges. Thank you very much. This is the fifth time you have joined us and we Thank look you. forward to next year too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.